Hi, JB here, and welcome to my bench. In this episode, we'll be talking about rigging a model with animatronics and show some of the results that you can get by following some of the techniques and methods. Animatronics cover a huge spectrum of examples, from simple cable and servo control to extremely advanced setups that are not too dissimilar from cutting-edge robotics. For this episode, I'm starting with the very basics in terms of examples, but hopefully it will help provide a good overview into things like design, choosing build materials, paint finishes, and picking the best method to control your model or prop. Traditionally, animatronics were used to impart motion into fantasy creatures, robots, or lifelike subjects. The ability to replicate movement and breathe life into characters has always been a fascinating art, blending the very best of artistic creativity with the very highest form of technological innovation. So, for my example, I'm really going to keep things simple, with an example project that can be used as a guide to help the planning process for any similar project that you might have. So, let's get going. For this project, I'm going to recreate Mr. Igo's gripper claw from his menacing pod from the movie Inner Space, an amazing Joe Dante film from 1987, starring Dennis Quaid, Martin Short and Meg Ryan. If you haven't seen this film, you are seriously missing out on a really fun comedy action adventure with some really impressive effects work from the team at ILM. The effects were so good, they won the Academy Award that year for Best Visual Effects. Now, I will be focusing on this specific build as it will be part of some other examples we will be doing in the future, where we plan to recreate some of the interior environment shots from inner space and also try some of our own methods of integrating model miniatures via motion control. So, it will all make sense in the future, when we shoot our future episodes. But for now, let's imagine our brief to follow is to create a robotic gripper claw that is to be shown for insert shots to the studio miniature. An insert shot allows us to build a larger scale section of our miniature that enables us to show more detail as well as have more physical space to fit any animatronic mechanism. Our preferred method of showing the claw moving will be via motion control, so that we can accurately and repeatedly move our model for repeat passes. So for that, I'm going to be using these amazing and small linear actuators from Actuonics. These are compact stepper motors that are configured for linear motion. And since I've discovered them, they have truly become game changing. They come in various flavours, as regular DC motor, RC servo, or stepper motor versions, each offering their own advantages to offer specific projects. For my example, I'm using the stepper motor versions, as they offer high accuracy and control when using our Dragon Frame motion controller. They can, however, just as effectively be controlled by Arduino, or control boards made by Actuonics themselves. Now, Actuonics have been super supportive and patient, as they very kindly donated us with a few of their actuators many months ago, and it's only until now that I can start to showcase them being used on our projects. This video is marked as a paid promotion because of their very kind donation, but I'm very soon to become a legit customer of theirs for more actuators, frankly, because they are really amazing. Be sure to check out their website for their wealth of products and support information about how they can provide motion solutions for countless applications. So I'm using a single P8ST stepper actuator with a 100mm throw with a 49 to 1 gear ratio. This particular gear ratio will give plenty of speed but at the expense of reduced torque. But that's okay, because the load that I need it to carry will be very low. Now, I haven't learnt CAD software, so I took the STL model from the Studio Miniature 3D print file and separated the claw in 3D Studio Max. I then edited the model to allow me to print the claw in its constituent parts. This allowed me to set pivot points to the joints as well as also allow me to hollow out the wrist section for the actuator to fit inside. For some reason, I decided to use a linkage system between the jaws of the gripper that used a magnet connection to rollers, so as to create a very simple mechanical connection that could mechanically self-disconnect if under too much mechanical stress, if the jaw was to open too wide. 
I'm still not sure why I did it this way, but hey, it worked. I think I wanted to give the visual impression that it was a piston or hydraulic motion that was being used. But as you can see in the original film, they seem to have used a cable control method for both the full size and insert shot model with the latter looking like it was hand puppeteered off screen and shot at a slightly lower frame rate to make the motion appear a bit more snappy. For the claw tip, I simply added some connection points and ran an elastic cord to one side and some fishing line to the other. When the opening and closing action of the jaws happen, it creates a pulley effect to the claw tip, very much how a tendon will naturally bend your fingertip when closing your hand. I used a resin printer for the parts, as I knew by printing them hollow would help keep the weight down to a minimum, which would further help the small actuator in moving the jaws. If durability was a higher priority, I would have printed the pieces on a filament machine, but that would have also entailed more cleanup of the printed parts. After 3D printing the parts at a manageable scale, I started to assemble the bearings, pins and washers as I had designed them to fit in 3D Studio Max. The scale of the claw was part determined from what easily accessible hardware components I could source, as well as what would be a good size to accommodate the actuator. Since this was a build only intended for an insert shot, the scale could be configured to what worked best under these parameters. The paint finish of the claw was done by a combination of airbrushing and hand-painted washes. From looking at the film reference, it was possible to see that the supposed materials were almost entirely metal, with varying degrees of light wear and oil stains. The general look of the pod appears reminiscent of a military submarine, so to me, the general paint finish to follow would be either temperature-treated metal or protective coatings applied to a metal surface. So first I lay down a base metal coloured paint that I purposely let thicken a bit more than I would normally for airbrushing. This gave me more of a textured or crackle coat finish that is similar in appearance found on heavy cast metals. This bare metal color is way too bright for our needs, so it can quickly be brought down by adding low light recess washes using transparent black. This takes the cold bright metal tone and pushes it more towards a warmer steel metal finish as well as allows us to define areas that would naturally receive more dirt or oil residue. Although we are not going for a very worn or battle damaged paint finish, it is often best to show a hint of wear to a supposed metal finish, as it can really help visually sell an object's material type and weight. A mechanical gripper such as this would likely in the real world be machined or cast out of heavy metal so any surface imperfections or scratches are good to embrace, as even brand new components like this would very quickly show signs of mechanical wear and tear. A good rule of thumb to use when weathering props or models is to add 10% more than looks right to the eye, as the effect on camera will inevitably be more subdued, especially when studio lighting is added. My personal view is that a camera takes in the whole object at once, versus your eye picking smaller detailed areas at a time. So the clearer that you can make any surface finish or weathering to how a camera is going to view it, the better. Upon studying the film and photographs of the full size prop and studio scale miniature, it is possible to see a few details that can easily be missed, like these hazard plates. I quickly modeled some in 3D and printed them out. I quickly masked the stripes and lightly scuffed and scraped the paint just before it dried. I then went in with some weathering to match the reference before gluing them in place. I added some metal cable sheath to simulate the top side cables seen on the gripper. I printed some small mounting blocks with holes so as to allow me to thread them and glue them into position. The final touch was to add a small amount of rub and buff silver wax onto any raised areas that would naturally receive contact during operation, as well as the odd areas to imply it had a few nicks or scrapes to its metal surface here and there. Now rub and buff is very easy to overdo, as only a small amount will go a really long way. Now I used a tiny amount and rubbed it into a paintbrush until virtually dry and then built up two to three washes of the wax until it left a realistic shiny metal edge. With one or two small spots of adding oil stains and a bit of black dirty wash, the paint job was done, 
and sealed with a satin gloss acrylic varnish to keep some of its metallic sheen. Now that the paint is done, it's time to assemble the actuator inside. The actuator model I chose was actually longer than I needed, at 100mm of throw. I could have easily used the model with 50mm throw, but as I designed the claw to have a very simple magnetic linkage, it enabled everything else to fit together using friction, meaning that I can reuse the motor for other projects. As you can see, the compact size of the actuator enabled me to fit it inside a carbon fibre tube and attach it to a round base that I 3D printed. What I love about these actuators is that they seem to be a perfect solution for applications like this, where it is easily possible to hide the motor within the design itself. For this demonstration, I'm showing the claw movement with additional rotation provided by my motion control turntable. If needed, this rotation could quite easily be provided by another motor that was dressed into a continuation section of the arm. For control of the actuator and turntable, I'm using Dragon Frame software with their DMC32 hardware control box. This setup allows me to keyframe position points and play them back in real time, or as incremental movement for stop or go motion animation. Dragon Frame works with stepper motors, which is why I chose that particular motor type, as they allow super accurate and repeatable motion that can perfectly match between passes. Having the ability to program a move and then play back at slower speed in synchronicity with a DSLR camera allows for very dynamic effects, such as go motion, where the camera shutter is left open for a small duration while the motors are moving between frame by frame exposures. This creates a real motion blur to the captured frames and ultimately mimics the effect of filming a real object in real time, traveling at fast or dynamic speeds. Now I'm currently upgrading our motion control box to 16 channels, which is why this messy looking pile of wires are here. It can look quite intimidating at first, but in future episodes I will help break down on how all this control hardware works and hopefully demystify it to those that are interested in experimenting with motion control for the first time. Hopefully that provides a general overview of the processes involved in design and build of a model or prop that needs some form of animatronic control. If the requirement for motion control was not needed, an RC servo actuator or cable control method could have been used for this build. Part of what makes animatronics so fascinating is that there are quite often many options to choose from in terms of control methods and often it is dictated by performance requirements and budget. So that's it. Let me know if you like this video and if it's the type of thing that interests you. If you have any requests for effects or animation techniques you'd like to be shown or explained, let me know in the comments section. If you really like these videos, be sure to check out our Patreon page, where these videos will have a seven day early access to members. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you'd still like to show your appreciation, there is a no obligation tip jar where you can give what you can so as to keep me supplied in cherry coke. Thank you so much to our existing Patreon members and thank you everyone else for watching.